and welcome to Lecture 6, Calibration. I'm Leia Morabito. I'm a UKRI Future Leaders Fellow at the University of Durham, and I am a radio astronomer working primarily, primarily with the Low Frequency Array, or LOFAR. So today we're going to talk about calibration. We're not necessarily going to walk through all of the details of every single step of calibration, but we're going to talk more about why you need to calibrate and what you need to calibrate for. Before we get started, I thought I would introduce myself to you as this is the first lecture I'm doing in this series. So like I said, I primarily use LOFAR, which is a phased array telescope. That means instead of dishes, it's made of dipole antennas. And here you can see me in a field of, of dipole antennas from LOFAR. And we combine all of these dipole wire antennas, um, all of the signals from them together in a particular station. And then each station operates as a dish. So LOFAR has dishes or stations spread all across Europe. Um, and so it's, a, it's an interferometer, just like the very large array, for example, but it's just made of stations of dipoles instead of dishes. So I use LOFAR mostly to look at radio AGN. So both radio quiet and radio loud sources. So radio loud sources like Cygnus A, which you've probably seen before, where you have the galaxy in the center and then these beautiful radio jets that um, extend far beyond the galaxy that are very, very bright in the radio. But I'm also interested in, in AGN that show radio, but don't have these large scale jets. So where is the radio emission coming from? This is still an unanswered question, and that's what I hope to use LOFAR to do. On a personal side, I like to do lots of other things. So for example, I like to play football. I have two wonderful dogs, and we love to go for walks in the countryside. Um, I also do some sewing, and you can see some of my science-inspired sewing here um, with, uh, with details from my, my PhD thesis on it. I also like to read. And in a former lifetime, before I did my PhD, uh, I got a scholarship for my undergraduate studies and from the US military, and I flew in this plane called the AWACS for uh, six years. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, well, first, we're going to cover why you need calibration. We'll talk about the different kind of errors that you have to correct for, that you have to calibrate for. We'll talk about how we parameterize calibration. Uh, so essentially, all of the mathematics of how we set up the formalism of how we solve for and correct for these errors. We'll go through a little bit of calibration strategy and talk a little bit about of calibration in practice, although you will have a tutorial where you'll go through calibration in great detail. To start with, why do we need calibration? In an ideal world, all of our measurements would be perfect. So here you can see in a two element interferometer, you have antenna one and antenna two, and you have your incoming wave front, right, that comes in. And if you know the geometry of this is the entire system, this is a perfectly flat uh, electromagnetic wave front. It hits antenna two, and then because you know the geometry, you can work out the time that it takes before it hits antenna one what we call the delay. And then each telescope is, of course, identical, perfectly identical, making a measurement in the exact same way. And you just take these, these measurements, which are voltages, you combine them, and you get the coherence of the electromagnetic field. So in a perfect world, that's how it works. However, we do not live in an ideal world. And so there's a lot of things that can go wrong. So the first thing that can go wrong is what we call propagation errors, which is essentially the atmosphere. So this is what things that impact the signal that's coming in to, to, towards the telescopes as it propagates along the line of sight. So in particular, the ionosphere and the troposphere are a big problem for, well, not necessarily a big problem, but something that we have to correct for um, with radio astronomy. And these are called propagation errors. Okay, so what happens after the electromagnetic wavefront comes in? It's possibly impacted by this, which means that you're no longer getting a perfectly flat wave coming in, you're getting something that's maybe distorted. So you can also have what we call um, pointing errors, or sorry, geometric errors. And so this includes things like pointing errors, um, your antenna locations, if you don't know them well enough, or if your antennas have maybe moved, um, wide bandwidths can impact uh, this because you have uh, different things going on with the at the high frequency end and at the low frequency end, different delays. And then finally, once things have hit your telescopes, you can have non-identical electronics and gains. 
So we build telescopes, for example, for the very large array to be exactly identical. So we expect them to have the same primary beam shapes, the same uh, antenna noise, uh, uh, instrumental noise, the same uh, gains, but that's not always the case. And so these are instrumental errors and uh, they, can, they can also impact your, your measurement of the coherence of the electric field. So these are the three main areas of what we need to calibrate for and why we need calibration in the first place. And we'll go through each one of these areas, starting with propagation errors. So this is the first thing that will impact your signal before it even reaches the antenna. So as I mentioned, the ionosphere and the troposphere are, can impact the, the propagation of the electromagnetic signal as it's coming towards you. So let's talk about the ionosphere first. The ionosphere is a partially ionized layer that's about 50 to 500 kilometers above the Earth's surface. And so if we cast this in terms of delay, the delay from the ionosphere is proportional to the phase uh, over 2 pi nu. And if we propagate this out into the physical constants um, of the actual ionosphere, which is, is composed of uh, free electrons um, that impact the electromagnetic wave coming in. You have the speed of light, the electron radius, and this is over two pi frequency squared. And then it's multiplied by this integral here, which is the integral of the electron density over the path length. So there's a couple things to note here. So first of all, this integral, uh, which is the integral over the electron density and the path length, gives you the total electron content in the ionosphere layer. And this is what we call the, the tech, total electron content. So you may never actually know what the electron density is or your line of sight, but you can measure what this total integral is. And usually what we solve for when we calibrate for the ionosphere is the tech. So note also that this delay depends on one over frequency squared. So that means that as your frequency gets lower, your delay gets much larger. And so this if effect is much, much worse at low frequencies than it is at high frequencies. So for LOFAR, which operates on, uh, just above and below the FM radio band, this is a particularly nasty problem. So let me show you what this looks like for so this is an example of what the ionosphere does to your observations. On the right hand side, you can see uh, a field with good ionosphere conditions. And on the left hand side, you can see a field with more typical or worse ionosphere conditions. So this is a field about three degrees across that uh, has been observed with LOFAR at two different times. And you can see what the ionosphere is doing. It's like you're laying at the bottom of a pool and looking up at the clouds and you see the clouds all waving around. And so this is what the ionosphere can do to your observations. It's particularly nasty because you can see that the sources in the field are moving in different directions at the same, at, at the same time, um, which means that the corrections for the atmosphere are not the same in different directions in the field. So you can't just apply a single correction to your data and expect it to take care of all of the ionosphere in your field. The other part of the atmosphere that I wanna talk about is the troposphere. This is the lowest layer of Earth's atmosphere. And this has rapid variations on the scale of minutes due to water vapor in the atmosphere. So this water vapor can cause some of the phases to be misaligned but you can correct for this by tracking this in a nearby source to your science target. There's also slow variation on the scale of hours due to the difference of time of propagation time um, in the atmosphere or the troposphere than uh, in a vacuum. This is easy to correct for because it can be estimated from the antenna location, the elevation and the local weather conditions. So you'll see often uh, that high frequency instruments, which are mostly impact impacted by the troposphere, um, generally have like a little local local weather station. Uh, so you can track the weather and then you know your antenna location and elevation um, and you can remove uh, the effects of the slow variation um, early either during correlation or very early after correlation. To show you what this looks like for uh, the Heart of Base Took radio telescope, which is in South Africa, which I, I got to go to a, a few years ago, which was quite exciting. Um, so this is the troposphere slow variation that's been tracked, um, and you can see the total delays in millimeters 
And to give you an idea of the scale here, about 2000 millimeters at 1.4 gigahertz is about seven milliseconds of delay. And so here's the, the slow troposphere being tracked over the scale of days in September 2011. And so we can just track this and then we, we just correct for it in our data. All right, let's move on to geometric errors. So this is the next thing that will impact your, your incoming signal. So the first thing is antenna locations. You might think that this is pretty obvious. You know where your antennas are, but that's not always the case. So for example, the very large array antennas move. Um, and here's uh, some pictures of them moving. So they're built, they have specially built rails and this specially built machine to, to go and move them. You can see here an antenna that's being connected to an antenna pad. Um, and the reason that they do this is because if you get larger baselines, you get better resolution. But if you have shorter baselines, you have better sensitivity to larger scale emission. And so the VLA cycles through different configurations, which means that they're moving their antennas in and out along these, these rails. And so the antenna positions change. It could also be that you've made measurements and something has happened. Um, you know, the earth is uh, minimally moving. There's uh, you know, seismic activity or whatever, and maybe your telescope position has shifted just very slightly. Um, but essentially, you just need to correct for your antenna positions. Maybe you've remeasured your antenna positions recently and just updated uh, those locations. And so this is just a very easy thing to, to correct for um, based on those better new positions that you've, you've remeasured. Another geometric error is um, solved for by what we call the Earth orientation parameters. And so the Earth has motion. Um, it's not just a simple going around the sun and spin of the Earth, but there's also precession and nutation and proper rotation and polar motion. And so all of these things need to be corrected for. The good news is that we have a model of, the, of, of all of this, this uh, motion, which is what we call the Earth orientation parameters. That's our model. And so we just can apply the Earth orientation parameters for each observation. Another geometric error um, is a pointing error. So how do you even know what your telescope is pointing at? If, is it pointing at the right thing? Is it pointing in the right direction? And for this, we use calibrator sources to help correct uh, our pointing errors. So a calibrator source is something where we know the position and we know the response that we should have. So if this is your beam, uh, the blue dashed line, and this is your source, the red circle here, right? If you're pointing perfectly at it, we know what the response should be. So that means if you point at a calibrator source and your pointing is a little bit off, you, you won't get the right response back. And so you know that you have an, an error and you can work out exactly how you need to correct this by moving your beam around and seeing how the response changes and then you can, you can work out what your pointing error is. Another geometric error is clocks. So in a connected interferometer, you have a single clock and this uh, clock signal, this timing signal is distributed to all of the antennas. So a good example of this is the very large array, which has a single hydrogen maser clock. And that signal is sent out to all of the antennas. So when they're making their measurements at the telescopes, each telescope is using that same clock to, uh, to timestamp the, the data. However, even if you have a single clock, and we'll talk about uh, non-connected interferometers later, um, where they have independent clocks, um, even if you have a single clock, the clock can drift in both frequency and time. So this is a, a graph of the short-term stability ranges of the various frequency standards. And by frequency standard here, they mean clock. So for example, the hydrogen maser um, has a particular delay. So you, you, it has a stability um, that is you know, on scales of uh, less than a day to a month. So clocks can drift in both time. Um, and so it, the clock value can change over time and this needs to be corrected for. And it also can drift in frequency. And so these can introduce uh, a geometric error because it essentially changes the delay um, in, your, in, your, in the model of your, your system. The final type of error that we'll talk about is instrumental errors. 
So this can be anything from signal path effects, for example, cables shrinking or expanding with temperature will change the path length that the signal travels along to the correlator. Uh, when you digitize the signal also, um, you can introduce noise, auto leveling for the correlator, um, anything like this that impacts the, that you, any operation you do on the signal can introduce noise. You also have problems because you have non-identical antennas. And so these can have different primary beams, uh, they're seeing through different atmosphere, they have different gains, uh, variations in elevation can deform the, the dish um, as gravity starts to pull on one side of the dish more. Uh, so for example, Effelsberg, which is a very, very large uh, dish uh, that I got to go visit, um, which was quite fun, it's, it's really big. Um, but as this tips over, the, the weight of the dish will actually cause it to deform a little bit. Um, and then your primary beam changes a little bit because your dish shape is changing, for example. And so you can see that the different telescopes have different gain curves. But again, this is something that we understand and that we can, we can predict based on what we know about the observation parameters. And we can construct these gain curves and uh, correct for them. You also have instrumental noise. And here I'm talking about what we call system temperature. So we tend to measure the noise in units of Kelvin or temperature. And again, this is the system temperature uh, for Affelsberg. And you can see that it changes as a function of time, right? And so the system temperature is not stable. And this could be because you know, the sky temperature is changing as, uh, as different things come into, into view. Um, could be changes um, uh, in the instrument as it's heating up, for example. And so this has to be corrected for. Another thing that you have to that you have to worry about is frequency response. Um, so here you can see this is the Effelsberg uh, frequency response. You can see the different frequency bands. You have problems with narrow band RFI. Um, you also here you can see this giant spike. This is resonance with the receiver, and things like this can change uh, the noise in your system. Okay, so those are the three main. Uh, types of errors that we have to correct for, um, and this is what we need calibration for. Calibration is basically to solve for all of these problems uh, and remove them from your data so you don't have to, to worry about uh, having a, a noisy final image. But how do we actually do this? So I've talked about all of these, these things in terms of concepts, but how do we actually sort out the mathematics of how we do this? We parameterize calibration uh, using what we call the radio interferometry, radio interferometry measurement equation, or RIME. And this relates the real visibilities to the observed visibilities by what we call a Jones matrix. So it's a simple equation, although it's a matrix equation, so the matrices can get quite complicated, but essentially you have your observed visibility, and this is equal to your true visibility operated on by what we call a Jones matrix. And so you can see here the subscripts I and J, and these are for antennas I and J, so this is a baseline value. So here your Jones matrix is a combination of the Jones matrix for antenna I and the Jones matrix for antenna J. The Jones matrices encode everything that impacts the propagation of the signal um, and anything that impacts it along the signal path. So the RIME assumes that the calibration is antenna-based, but later on we'll see that this can be uh, baseline dependent. And by antenna-based, I mean you can see that you have individual Jones matrices for antennas, and then these are combined to give you a baseline, uh, baseline information. So CASA and other radio uh, software as well decomposes the RIME into different terms, and we solve for these independently. So here you can see the equation from the last slide, but this Jones matrix has now expanded into a lot of different matrices. And these different matrices all have, uh, are, are all, each one of them is a different correction for a different effect. But, and we'll go through, we'll go through all of these matrices. So don't worry so much about writing everything down on this slide. But, okay. We've, we've got the mathematics here, but how do we actually solve for these Jones matrices? If we're going to solve for them using this equation, right? We have our observed, 
don't we need to know the true visibility to figure out what the Jones matrix is? Well, the answer is yes, but what we do is we use calibrator sources. Um, so a calibrator source is something where we actually know what the, the source looks like. We know what it should look like. We can predict exactly the parameters it will have during an observation. And that gives us our true or model visibility. And then using that, we can find the Jones matrices. So there's different types of calibrators. And we'll talk a little bit about calibration strategy. So we typically use a primary calibration um, where we use a known standard source to determine the instrumental effects. So the instrumental effects should not change dependent on where you're, where you're pointed at on the sky. Um, and so these are both time and direction independent quantities, and they're typically antenna-based effects. And by using a primary calibrator, we can solve for them and remove them from our system. After that, we need a secondary calibrator to estimate the local conditions, so local time dependent conditions. So for example, the atmosphere. Um, and we do this on a secondary calibrator that is close to our science target. And then finally, uh, self-calibration. We won't talk about self-calibration as this should be covered in another lecture, but essentially once you've used a primary calibrator and a secondary calibrator, you can use the target itself uh, to determine highly time dependent and direction dependent quantities and refine the calibration. So good primary and secondary calibrators will have well-known accurate positions. They will have just compact enough structure to be unresolved on the longest baselines, but still not be so compact that they'll be variable, um, that they will have variable flux densities. They will have very well flux density uh, uh, flux scales and spectral shapes to solve for the flux scale and the bandpass uh, for the primary calibrator in particular. And for polarization calibration, you also need to understand the polymer polarimetric properties. We won't really cover polarization here, um, but maybe you'll do it in a tutorial or maybe a more advanced tutorial at a later date. So what does this look like in practice when we go out and we observe something? Well, we want to observe our source, right, our target, but we also need to observe a primary calibrator and a secondary calibrator. So the primary calibrator, which is sometimes also called the flux calibrator, um, and is used to find, again, those direction independent and time independent uh, values um, can be somewhere else in the sky. And this will be something that's very, very bright so you can get very good signal to noise. And we'll talk about that later uh, in the next lecture, but it doesn't have to be very close to the target. And then you need your secondary calibrator or your gain calibrator, it's sometimes called, or your phase calibrator all of these terms kind of mean secondary calibrator. And this will be something that's close to the target so that you can track the local conditions and use your calibrator source to correct for, for the local conditions and then transfer those solutions to the target. So the strategy is you observe your flux calibrator and then you observe your target and gain calibrator close together. And sometimes we, we go back and forth between the target and the, the gain calibrator or the secondary calibrator. So in practice, so the first thing that you want to do is you want to start with solving for these Jones matrices. And the first thing that we do is we start with things that are known or tracked during the observation that we don't actually need a calibrator source to solve for. So for example, elevation dependent gain curves. We've already seen these, these gain curves for Effelsberg, Jodrell Bank, and Onsla. Um, and like I said, you can you, you use uh, local weather stations to track and you know what the atmosphere is doing. Um, you have a model of your antenna, you know what elevation is pointed, you can model these gain curves and then remove them from the data. This does not require a calibrator. It's something that's, that's tracked or known before the observation, before you do any calibration, um, just simply from the, the observation parameters. Another thing that we can correct for that we don't need a calibrator source for um, is the time dependent sensitivity. So we, uh, you've already seen this, this curve here, um, which is the system temperature in units of Kelvin versus time. Um, and this is uh, typically called, typically this correction is, is um, 
we use the system equivalent flux density, or SEFD. And so the SEFD is in units of, um, uh, is used to convert the temperature um, of the system temperature to units of flux density, so units of Jansky. So again, this is something that we know beforehand because we know our system. We don't need a calibrator source to correct for this. And just here's another, a different antenna just to show you uh, what a different, um, a different SEFD curve might look like, system temperature curve might look like. Okay, and uh, the third thing here that has a little green check is uh, the parallactic angle. Um, which is something that you, you know just from the geometry of the system. And so again, you can correct for this. So these things that you, you can just correct for because they're either known or tracked during the observation are called a priori calibration. So this is things that we know beforehand, we don't need a calibrator source, um, and we can just go ahead and correct for them based on the observation parameters. So examples of a priori calibration are uh, water vapor, um, antenna position corrections, which we talked about earlier, uh, the parallactic angle. Uh, the ionosphere can actually be um, an a priori calibration because we can get tech measurements from GPS uh, satellites. Um, weather tables can help us with a priori uh, calibration and also just reformatting or removal of bad values. So all of that can be done without having to use a calibrator source. And during your tutorial, you'll get a chance to do a priori calibration. Okay, so further calibration, we will need a calibrator source for. We'll need a calibrator source that we have a good model for, so we're able to solve for the rest of these uh, Jones matrices. And so when we do this, um, we use a, a sky model of that calibrator source um, to solve for the rest of the Jones matrices. And remember that these Jones matrices contain visibility-like information. They're not visibilities themselves, but they have the same format, which means that they are complex numbers, and uh, complex numbers, if you remember, can be decomposed or represented as amplitudes and phases. And typically when we talk about calibration, we talk about calibrating amplitudes and phases rather than uh, complex numbers. But we will cover this in the next lecture. So this is what we've talked about in this lecture today. We talked about why you needed calibration. We talked about the three different kinds, the three different main areas of, of errors that you have to calibrate for. So propagation errors, geometric errors, and instrumental errors. We talked about the mathematics of how we parameterize this so that we can actually solve for these different errors. A little bit about calibration strategy, and we briefly touched on calibration in practice. So I look forward to seeing you in the interactive question and answer sessions or on Slack, and I'll see you in the next lecture.